Watch out now, take care, beware of darkness. Watch out now, take care, beware of thoughts that linger, the hopelessness around you. Uh, in the dead of night, it can hit you, it can hurt you, make you sore, and what is more, that is not what you are here for. Watch out now, take care, beware of greedy leaders. They take you where you should not go. Beware of darkness. Welcome to episode six of our BT Advent series entitled The Wife of Uriah's Longing Heart. The lyrics that began this episode are from a song by George Harrison called Beware of Darkness. The story we're about to look at is full of that darkness. It's a dark, dark story, and I hate it. <laughs> but it's a story of Jesus' ancestors, and Matthew puts it right in the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew says, hey, wait, before we look at the birth of Jesus, I want you to take a look at that story about the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Remember that great King David, the Lord's anointed, a man after God's own heart. Remember him and Uriah's wife. Why does he want us to look at this story? Why is it part of the Advent story? Well, that's what we'll wrestle with in this episode. Our scripture reading is 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 to 17, and then verses 26 to 27. But feel free to read all the chapter 11 and, and even chapter 12 to get more of the story. Uh, before we dive in, we'll take a moment to pray. And again, I'm going to use an Advent prayer from the North Umbria community. So would you pray with me? <clears throat> Show us, Lord Jesus, how we may prepare to celebrate your birth in this world. Show us those things that we need to repent of, that we may find your forgiveness. Show us how to avoid greed and the selfishness of this season and focus on what is truly essential. Amen. Chapter 11, verse 1 of 2 Samuel. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all of Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her and she came to him and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all of the servants of his Lord and he did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you've just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths and my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house? to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also and tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. 
And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his Lord. But he did not go down to his house. Verse 14. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. As Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew they were valiant warriors. The men of the city came out and fought with Joab and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite was killed as well. And we skip down to verse 26. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. I hate this story. It's an evil mess of sin, pain, death, and hurt. It is darkness. In the aftermath of this story, we that the, find that the child of David and Bathsheba from this affair dies. Uh, Nathan, the prophet, confronts David, and there'll be more personal and national tragedy springing from the sin. And then Bathsheba eventually gives birth to King Solomon, who's the next ancestor and king on the way to Jesus. So besides Solomon eventually being born, what does this have to do with Christ in the manger? And where is the hope for us? And where is the hope for the world in this story? Well, the evil in this story, it isn't all that different from the evil going on when Christ was born or the evil we see in our world today. Jesus' ancestors were messy, sinful people. David, the king of Israel, commits great sexual violence, sexual sin that leads to violence and death. In the time of Christ at his birth, uh, the Jewish king is King Herod who participates uh, in similar sexual sin and then violence. Uh, in the David story, uh, a child dies as a result of King David's great sin. Uh, when Jesus is born, King Herod will murder the innocent in Bethlehem seeking the life of the newborn king. Leaders commit sexual sins, and then do more evil and violence to hide their sin and maintain their power. That happened with King David, that happened with King Herod when Jesus was born, and that sounds like something pulled right from the headlines today. Watch out now, take care, beware of darkness. This is the darkness of David's kingdom. This is the darkness of the world Christ enters. This is the darkness of the nation that's supposed to be God's people. This is the darkness of our world. I hate this story. Where does this story lead us? How does it point us to the child in Bethlehem this Advent season? I think this story is to lead us to self-examination, confession of sin, and repentance. Sin is so, so, so bad, and it only leads to tragedy. David is the greatest king in the history of Israel. He is brave, he is handsome, he is wise. He is the Lord's anointed and a man after God's own heart. He fights the giant Goliath while still a boy. He writes beautiful poetry to God that becomes holy scripture. Yet look at the depth of his sin. It ruins him, his family, and his nation. See the depths of sin, how one thing leads to another in this story. He stops going to war, he stops working, hangs out for a bit. He sees a beautiful woman, and then, and then, and then. And there is a cover-up. People who do the right thing like Uriah have to get punished. M murder happens. Uh, throwing a battle, <laughs> probably getting other people killed. In, in, in the midst of what David has to do to hide his sin, probably losing the confidence of his own soldiers. Sin is so bad 
Uh, we should see the web of our sin in this story. Uh, in America, where I live, and in other Western nations, there's such a great emphasis on individualism. And so even when we talk about sin or mistakes or evil that we do, we often think, well, maybe this just hurts me or this is just about me. It doesn't impact other people, right? I'm not hurting anybody else. It's just not true. Our sin will have the same tentacles as David. Um, here, it's, it's laid out in such dramatic fashion. It might not always look this dramatic, but it impacts all the people we care about and even our nations. I'm married with three children. And one thing that's become as plain as day to me in the last 12 years is that my sins, my faults, my mistakes always have a negative impact on the four people that I care the most about. And as my kids grow up and I'm realizing I can't undo all of it and magically become a perfect father and raise perfect kids, I see the effects of darkness of sin. It creeps in, it messes up everyone. And from my family to every family, uh, sin and darkness covers all the nations. At the heart of David's sin and our sin, it, it's rejection of neighbor and God. Now, this chapter ends with this, just lays out this story. And the final line is, this displeases the Lord. It's against God and against neighbor. And that's a hard thing to look at in ourselves when we do wrong. Do I hate God and my neighbor? Of course not, I'd say. But the choosing of this sin, the choosing to hide sin, the choosing to stay in sin, it's, it's to hate God and hate neighbor. If David can sin this way, all of us can. And the more power we have, the more authority we have, the more responsibility we have, the greater capacity to sin in such a massive way. So the Advent season, it's a season to examine our sin and repent. It's a season to admit the darkness in which we live and to admit our participation in that darkness. That darkness doesn't just surround us. It certainly does. But there's a darkness in us that makes the whole world a bit more dark. And we need to watch out now and take care and beware of darkness. What do we do when we live in a darkness and participate in a darkness that cannot be overcome by any human effort? It's the blind leading the blind, right? We cannot make the light to lead out of the darkness. We can't generate light in our own power. Where is the light, right? An innocent man is killed in the David story. That man is Uriah the Hittite. He's a foreigner to the land. Now listen to this. His name means Yahweh is my light. In our darkness, in this world's darkness, in the darkness in us, we need a supernatural light to overcome that darkness. Yahweh will have to be our light. I'm more and more convinced that that's the only way we overcome darkness like David's and darkness like our own. We'll need a foreigner to leave their home and come into our space. We need someone else not from here to move into our neighborhood. And that's what Jesus chooses to do. A light source from heaven, the light of the world, breaks into our world to fight that darkness. In, in the accounts in the Luke birth stories of Jesus, and we'll see in the upcoming episodes, the father of John the Baptist will give a prophetic, prophetic word about his son in Jesus. And here's how it goes. And this is in uh, Luke chapter one, I believe. You child will be called the prophet of the most high for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. So he's giving this great word. We can be saved from the darkness and find forgiveness. How? And this is verse 78 of Luke 1. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. See that image? He knows we're sitting in the shadows of death, but a light's going to break on high. Jesus is born and there are shepherds just like King David and they're sitting in the city of David, the hills of the city of David, toiling in their darkness at night. And verse eight of Luke two says, in that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. An angel of the Lord stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them. The light breaks in. They're terrified. 
The angel said to them, do not be afraid for see, I'm bringing you good news, great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of, that's right, David, a savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. In verse 13, suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. The light of Christ breaking into the darkness of those shepherds. Glory, glory, glory in your darkness, in David's darkness, a real savior, a real anointed one, a real Messiah, a real king, a real Lord has come and that lights up the night sky. Eight days later, there's an old man named Simeon waiting for things to change and waiting for the darkness of his own death. And he sees the child Jesus in the temple. And this is what he says. Master, you're dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all the peoples. Verse 32 a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. What do we see in that Jesus story, in this manger story, in this Advent story? Light and glory, tender mercy from on high for all who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. That shadow of death, that's some lyrics from David's hit song, Psalm 23. Another one of David's hits, Psalm 27, says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The way through the darkness, and the darkness is as dark as David's sin and our own sin. The way through that darkness around us and in us is looking to Jesus Christ. He's the only one with light that can overcome that darkness. He's the light of the world. and He's the only one who can open our eyes from the darkness of sin. So this Advent season, take some time to repent and look to the light of Christ in his season, in this season. He has the power to overcome all the darkness. He does overcome that darkness by his death on the cross. One more innocent than Uriah chooses to take all the darkness upon himself on the cross. The innocent Jesus goes to the depths of the darkness for us. And then he brings the light of resurrection on Easter morn. He brings in himself a light to this world that's greater than all the darkness of our sin. Repent of that sin, flee from it, cling to his light, rejoice in the forgiveness and new life you can find this Christmas season in Christ our Lord.